Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Judith Rose, Acting Director of Villa Albertine, and it is my pleasure tonight to welcome Anne-Sophie de Gasquet, Director of Paris Musée, and Melissa Chu, Director of the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, for this new installment of the museum series, organized in partnership with the Center for Curatorial Leadership and its director and co-founder, Buffy Easton. Launched in February 2023, the museum series aims to contribute to the conversation around the future of museums by providing a unique transatlantic space for professionals to meet and discuss the current challenges faced by their institutions. Tonight's dialogue is an occasion to understand the role of museums' networks more deeply from the perspectives of both network leadership and membership. We're all eager to hear about our speakers' respective experiences and to explore new dimensions of these topics together. Cher Anne-Sophie, before becoming General Director of Paris Musée, you had worked both for famous French cultural institutions, such as the Centre Pompidou, and in government, serving for many years at the City of Paris and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The diversity of your background convinced the board members of the City of Paris to appoint you head of the Paris Musée Network in April 2021. At a time when museums across the globe were facing the difficulties of a post-COVID world, it was surely a challenge to lead all of the 14 museums and historical sites of the city, especially since Paris Musée was engaged in several large projects, such as the reopening of the Musée Carnavalet. Your experience will give us much to reflect on in terms of museum collaboration and leadership. Dear Melissa, you were appointed head of the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in 2014 after serving many years at New York's Asia Society, first as a curator for contemporary Asian and Asian American art, and then as director. Since the beginning of your professional career in your home country of Australia, you've always promoted international dialogue in the field of arts, trends specifically and beyond as evidenced by your presence tonight. Your respective organizations, together with the distinctness of your career path, shed new light on the questions this series addresses, especially those related to cooperation between institutions. Before handing the floor to Buffy, let me express my special thanks to Agnes Gond, Marie-José Craves, Denise littlefield Sobon, Sana Sabag, and Beatrice Stern for their generous support to the Museum Series Initiative. I wish you all a very pleasant evening, and I look forward to seeing you on December 4th for the final event of our 2023 Museum Series, during which we will welcome Souraya Noujaim, former director of the Louvre Abu Dhabi and now head of the Islamic Art Department at the Louvre in Paris, and Alexandra Monroe, Director for Curatorial Affairs at the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, to discuss the expansion of global museums in the 21st century. Buffy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, and um, I look forward very much to this conversation. We always have a warm-up conversation a few days beforehand where we actually have the real conversation, <laughs> and, then, and then this is, reenacts that to a certain degree, but um, we have a few surprises, I hope. So, Melissa, you run an institution that is one of 21 museums in the Smithsonian Network, and Anne-Sophie, you direct the Paris Musée, which manages 14 museums. So um, I'm going to start with Anne-Sophie. What would you say are the advantages of a group of museums together that, um, that you run? Paris Musée was created 10 years ago by the city of Paris uh, to regroup together the 12 museums of the city of Paris and two historical sites. And um, the aim of the reform 
of the creation of Paris Musée was uh, to give more visibility to these museums. That was the first point. Um, but it was also to mutualize the strengths of our museums to increase and to diversify the audience, uh, but also to develop the own resources of the museum. So that was the first object. And thanks to um, this institution, we worked together uh, for this purpose, you know? So uh, our mission is to preserve and uh, to share the collection, but also to open them to the largest audience. So that's also our mission. So the museum uh, develop a program of exhibition, of publication, but also um, a cultural program for all the audiences. So together, we have one budget, and that we share between all the activities that we have. So, for example, we have one um, financial department, one human resources department, one exhibition department, and all the people work for all the museums together. So we have very big museums, we have small museums, but we share all the um, people working for them. So... If you think of your central command, it makes a lot of sense. But Melissa, you're one museum of many. So how, I mean, I'd like to talk about the advantages and the challenges of that. And so what would you say the strength of being part of the Smithsonian is for the Hirshhorn? So the Hirshhorn is the Smithsonian's modern and contemporary art museum. And so, Actually, it's been of great benefit to us to be part of a Smithsonian family because artists are always thinking above and beyond their medium and above and beyond art itself. So if I think to just the last few years, we have we, we curated and organised Laurie Anderson's major survey exhibition Prior to that, she was very interested in the moon, so she collaborated with our Air and Space Museum across the way. Just um, only a few months ago, we collaborated with the Smithsonian's American History Museum, where they had an exhibition of democracy, and we wanted to work with Jenny Holzer, and so we simultaneously projected onto both our respective buildings for the opening week, simultaneously, Jenny Holtz's work, which were a series of historical quotes about democracy. So there are many moments, actually, when we come together to collaborate on exhibitions, if not also projects. So one of the um, works that I'm most proud of is that we collaborated with the Smithsonian's American Art Museum to co-acquire Arthur Jaffer's Love is the Message, The Message is Death, an extraordinary video artwork that is really about the black experience here in America. And when we were all closed during COVID, we realized that it was a moment, but also an opportunity to share a work like that. So we worked with the artist and we also then collaborated with all of the other 13 museums across this country and around the world who had that work in their collection. And we web streamed it for um, one weekend, Saturday and Sunday, at a moment where there were no museums open around the world. And it was a Black Lives Matter moment. And it was a very poignant collaboration, I think, within the Smithsonian, but also beyond. So we see it as um, something that really adds to another dimension to our ability to connect with other collections and also connect with other audiences. Well, that makes a very compelling case, I must say, for being part of an organization that where you might not find commonality between all the institutions. So An Sophie, this is usually my first question. Um, An Sophie, you are not trained as an art historian. And here I always love to make the comparison between France and America in the training of curators mm -hmm. 
and directors because they have to, in France, take the concours, yeah. and it's just an impossible thing to um, succeed at, and the ones who do are just amazing, and they go on to be incredibly impressive leaders. And I will say that um, the Villa Albertine had the sponsorship to do a curatorial exchange between France and America, and I went um, to France recently uh, with Francois and uh, was at the epicenter of this training engine, which is so impressive and so different from the variety of training that American curators tend to have. But your training is not like that. So would you tell everybody just a little bit about how you came to run this large group of museums? Yeah. Um, first, I studied political science and international relationships in France and in Spain, and then uh, management of cultural affairs. But since the beginning of my career, uh, I have always worked in the cultural field, you know. Um, it was for several French cultural institutions like uh, Centre Pompidou, Musée d'Art Moderne, or Palais de Tokyo. Um, I also worked for the city of Paris, but always for cultural affairs, you know, with the mayor of Paris and with the cultural, um, the, the deputy mayor in charge of culture, well, always in culture, and for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs also, for the French Institute. Uh, or for the French uh, Minister of Culture of Foreign Affairs, but as a cultural counselor. So um, for for all these um, jobs, you know, I was driven by the the desire to 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 organize exhibition, to make exhibition possible, to work with artists, and to convince partners. You know, but. For Paris Musée, um, the city of Paris uh, made the choice to uh, appoint um, an administrative director. So I am the administrative director and I work with 12 art historians who are the directors of the museum. So we, will, we really have different roles in the organization of Paris Musée and I think it's really uh, interesting, this organization. So given that the idea behind this series was about women um, in leadership uh, running museums both in America and abroad. Um, Melissa, you were a well-known curator internationally, and I just thought maybe you could talk a little bit about your path and how it then came to running a museum and what you see as the trade-off in a way between being a curator who can do exhibitions. I know there are some people in the audience here who have made similar trade-offs as they've gone up the food chain to positions of great authority. I'm looking at one right now. And um, I just, I think it, it's always an interesting path for me because um, some people leave that curatorial world with some reluctance. So what, so what do you think? Share with us a little your path. So I think that's often a question directed at directors who have been curators before, like how do you give it up? I, I think for me, I see it as curating the program rather than curating the exhibition. I think for a modern art museum, modern contemporary art museum, we're always looking at a balance between collection shows, shows that really allow us to think differently about the collection working with specific artists, commissioning work. So I like to see it as a, as a curatorial role, but one that's not curating shows. Um, so it was less of a difficult transition for me and we're, you know, we're still a museum where I can be involved in that program. So I'm ha happy about that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think we all go into art and museums because we love the art and because we're interested in artists. And so I think to lose touch with that entirely would be hard. Well, that would, yes. And so I'm glad that, That's that you have it. It's, a, it's important to keep that front and center. So I'm Sophie, you said, wait, I have to put my glasses back on to read your quote. Um, that you want the Paris Musée museums to be places of life. That's a 
quote that's very, that kind of is, captures a feeling. So can you talk about that? Yes, because I really think that museums are a place uh, where all the public are welcome, where uh, all the people can spend time uh, with their family with, or alone. Or it can be many different publics. And, you know, uh, we made uh, many reno renovations these last years in Paris Musée. For example, the Musée Carnavalet was completely renovated at the Museum of History of the City of Paris. And that's the way we renovated this museum. We created places for the public to wait, for the public to rest, for the public to have lunch. And I think that's part of the experience, to be part of our life. And that's the way we like to welcome our public. I think more and more that's the way we think about the experience of being in a museum. So, Melissa, you've spoken before on the importance of allowing artists to contribute to the mission and legacy of the Hirshhorn. So could you talk a little bit more about the successful partnership between uh, what, a, what the museum and an artist, that kind of partnership, what that looks like? Yes, so we often talk amongst ourselves at the Hirshhorn about what distinguishes us perhaps from our Smithsonian peers. And it really is about our relationships to artists. And so I remember when I first joined the Hirshhorn, I, we had a curatorial retreat because I was very keen to know uh, what the curators felt were the most successful exhibitions at the Hirshhorn. And by far and away, their nominations were exhibitions that were really where the work didn't try to fight with the architecture. We are a round building. I like to say to Richard Armstrong here at the Guggenheim that we're the other round building. Well, they're the other round building. But we don't make people walk uphill to see that. Um, but it is a round building. It's a very unique building. It's um, nearly 50 years on, so it's kind of brutalist. It was built in 1974. And so the, there were two exhibitions in particular that the, the curatorial team spoke of, and they were um, Hiroshi Sugimoto's Seascape Show, where he did away with all of the attempts to create a white cube within a circle. And it was really a series of seascapes placed um, on the walls, which created a panoramic view of the whole... It was a panoramic gallery of sorts. And it made the look... It looked like a series of windows to the outside um, world. It was an impressive exhibition. And it made me think about what the uniqueness of the Hirshhorn's position within the world could be, which is how do you commission artists to create works that are peculiar to the architecture of the building? And so we started with um, uh, an invitation to Mark Bradford. And that resulted in a work that he created that was all about a, a, ser a response, really, to the Civil War. And the fact that it was our museum located right on the National Mall, speaking at the moment of a national conversation about what to do with civil, um, the Civil War monuments in the South specifically. It was a very um, poignant moment, but it was essentially a, um, a painting that spanned the entire length of the museum. It was 300 linear feet. And so that kind of began, I think, a series of commissions and working closely with artists on works that were situated within the building. And some of them we retained, actually. Mark Bradford was meant to be a one-year project. We really don't want to move that work. Um, we also worked with Laurie Anderson, I mentioned before, on a survey exhibition, and she created an installation uh, which was her really, it was meant to be just a very straightforward wall painting, but ended up being a painting in an entire gallery of every square foot of the walls plus the floor. 
And so it was like being inside Laurie Anderson's head. And when we were preparing to close the exhibition, um, her studio manager said to me, oh, you know that's Laurie's probably her last great work. And so then I started to have nightmares that here we were painting over Laurie's last great work and not being good stewards of um, an artist's legacy. So we decided to keep it on display um, for the moment. And that, was, that decision was actually one of the hard, probably one of the hardest that, that we made during um, my tenure because it, it realigned a whole gallery program so there are a lot of unhappy people at the Hirshhorn just at that moment in time. We're all over it now. But um, so that, that's kind of, I think that those two examples, I think, illustrate to some degree some of the working relationships that we've had with artists where we have an idea either for the architecture or in a subject and theme, and then we try to make it So happen. I'm going to ask you something unplanned, which is when you commission a work of art and the artist becomes really inspired and make something much bigger than what you commissioned. Um, how, do you, how do you go with that? And obviously everything is a cost benefit. You know, you allow one artist more space, it means less space for others. And keeping something on permanent display means there's less wall space for other people. So how, what goes on in your head? Because you want to inspire an artist when you do commissions, and now the Met is doing commissions for its facade and its great hall. And I'm just so curious about um, the life of a commission when it really takes off, which is what you want. What, what goes on in your head, and how do you think about that? It's such a great question, Buffy, because it's such a, it's a delicate balance in some ways, between wanting to present the full possibility of what, what and where the work could be in the museum to an artist in order to get them excited about creating something. And then when the proposal, when we talk about the proposal, it's always extraordinary. The issue then comes down to how are we going to fund it? And these are always the conversations there's, there's never a project, I don't think there's ever been a project where we, <laughs> we begin and end in the same place. So this is always the work that we're doing, which is why the relationship with an artist is so important, because in some ways it's about, ultimately about this, this idea of trust. It's like there's trust that we're all, we're all going to do this together and we're all, we all want the same thing which is an extraordinary work of art. And so there's this whole push and pull, give and take that happens when it comes to the first costing and then the second costing and then the third costing. <laughs> and then the legacy of what happens to it afterwards as well. It's, I, I just think about that all the time. I'm sorry, forgive me, I'm going to ask Melissa a follow-up question again, which is, I did not know that Melissa is a TV star as well until um, my new assistant brought it to my attention and she's here, Grace Aller. And um, so today I was watching you on your TV show, which deals with a group of, how many artists, seven or something? six artists who go through a series of um, challenges. And I listened to what you said and um, saw the art historian in you when, I mean, you know, these are real artists, it's not a joke and it's not play acting. So can you just talk about, I mean, there you are commissioning the greatest artists alive today for the Hirshhorn and then you're on a TV show where you have real practicing artists who are not famous or that advanced doing challenges. Um, can you talk a little bit about the difference between your role as a museum director and as a TV star? And, um, and what goes into dealing with artists, you know, in front of a camera 
in what is otherwise a very private, I would imagine, I mean, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but private experience. There's no comparison between the two roles. And when I, when I finished up the project, it was two weeks of filming, I fully understood why they have unions on set. Because it's like a crazy work schedule. It's 8 a.m. to 1 a.m. And most of the filming happens at midnight after you've been sitting around all day. Mm. And that's why a lot of the um, final scenes where you're where the artists have spent their time creating the work and then it's presented. And so, you know, our the reason why we wanted to be involved, the Hirschhorn in this project was that we have this whole idea of um, being quite different from other museums of modern and contemporary art, meaning we're free. So there's, a, there's an access, accessibility piece. We talk, talk about radical accessibility a lot. That a lot of our audiences and visitors are encountering modern art for the very first time. And so with that kind of mission, we, we leaned into this idea of producing a television docu-series with rising artists, the Smithsonian Channel, and the reach of 120 million households through MTV and Smithsonian Channel. And so we thought that the goal would be to share the idea of an artist as maker and share some of that process around what it really takes to make art. And so that's really why we did the series. And, you know, those artists, I, you know, it's funny, we, um, we spent a lot of time together on set and, you know, we, we forget how hard it is to be an artist. And I think that that show actually allows people some insight into that. It, it's, it's very difficult to create work that's compelling under time constraints, under subject constraints, so. And isn't it difficult for you too to give a critique as it's being created? It's such a tentative, sensitive moment. Well, to be gentle. And you have such a voice of authority. Well, to, my whole thing was how, 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 how could the interaction be constructive but also kind of nurturing? Because we see on TV, you know, it, it, some of the some some sometimes those kinds of series are more kind of takedown efforts, and we wanted this to be constructive for the artists who are participating, um, but also help people to understand what perhaps a museum person's role could be within that. Yeah. I mean, I think when we all started our life in the art world, people didn't know what curators did. Now there are restaurants called curators and, you know, it's like a little like gourmet. It's like a really overused word, but it was to help people understand maybe the role that museums could play yeah. as well within society. So um, both of you work in the nation's capital of your country and you have an immense number of national and international visitors every year. Um, so... In America, accessibility is a very important word, and also the notion of community. Who are you reaching out to? Who is your community? And so, Anne-Sophie, just would you like to talk a little bit about what that looks like um, in the Paris Musée? In Paris Musée, 60% um, of our public is French and 40% is international audience. Um, before the sanitary crisis, it was quite different because it was 52% of French. So we still have more French than uh, international audience. Um, for all our public, you know, um, we are, the collection are free. It's re really free of charge for everyone, but um, we charge for the exhibitions. But we have, social 
programs for many people. We, uh, we try to organize specific program uh, for young people, from children with, uh, city, uh, with um, the schools of the city of Paris and around Paris. Uh, we have um, family programs, for example, we decided to organize um, family weekend for free. Uh, so each month you can have a family weekend, you can go to a, a museum of the city of Paris uh, and you have this kind of event in one of our museums. But we also work with uh, non-profit organizations, many non-profit organizations um, in the social field um, to organize visits, to organize workshops, um, for, child, for, for example, for children uh, receiving uh, welfare support, or for hospitalized children or adults, uh, for women in precarious uh, situation, for migrants, for refugees. So that's through non-profit organizations. So for them, we organize special visits, we organize workshops, uh, specific booklets. For example, we have booklets for people learning French. So <clears throat> we have different proposals, and I think it's very important. We are, this is the role of the museum. I think we have really a responsibility for that. So of, of your museums, which is the most popular that is visited? Uh, the most popular is the Petit Palais, which is a museum of fine art of the city of Paris, and the Museum of History, the Musée Carnavalet, because uh, before the renovation of the Museum Carnavale, we have um, 400,000 people and now we have 1 million people oh visiting goodness. each year the museum. Oh so it's God. really successful. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And we have a specific public for Carnavale, you know. Uh, people from Paris love this love museum. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and international audience too, so we're very happy. And so, does a different kind of person visit the catacombs? Yeah. <laughs> that was my favorite part of this. Yeah, so the catacomb is very specific, and we have a very international audience, and the first international audience is American. 800,000 people go to the catacombs every year. Yeah, so it's the most popular site. Has anybody, <laughs> how many people in this audience have been to the catacombs in Paris? Everyone Great. with me. <laughs> Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> so do you want to talk a little bit, Melissa, about your, you know, the, the Smithsonian notion of community, your notion of community? Um, it's changed so much in recent years. Yeah, it's interesting in Washington because the Smithsonian museums tend to think of themselves as national museums and local DC museum second. And I think while at the Hirshhorn, the lion's share of our audience is national and international, we have a very robust local community that I think we've done a lot to develop over the last um, a decade or so. One of the first things that, uh, that I realized was that we really didn't have any children in the museum sounds weird now, but looking back, we had no family programs, no education programs, so now every weekend we do that. Um, but in addition to that, it was really about how we reach out to different communities within DC. It's a very different city from New York, and it's you know, there, there are divisions. And so one of the um, first things that I did with the Astigates who um, we brought on board, he did a series of performances with the specific notion of engaging different communities within DC. And it was called Processions and he did one performance a year and each one was very different. So the first one, he kind of looked at the museum and he said, hmm, the Hirshhorn, it's kind of like a racetrack, isn't it? And so he, we worked with Howard University students and they ran in the inner circle galleries around while he and his monks of Mississippi um, took a walking singing tour of the collection and sang out artist names as they walked through. It was a fantastic program that kind of launched a, a series 
that then did different things on different occasions, whether it was um, working with a black choir and a white choir individually and then together to sing, um, or an artist retreat which brought the artist community together. But it is, it's interesting, it's the, the moments that I've observed where things really work in terms of that local community have been performative. So when we hosted Abigail DeVille's performance at sunrise in our sculpture garden outside, I thought no one would show up. But they had, uh, they had music, they had, I mean, we had 300 people at sunrise. So I think that it has tended for us, at least, to be performative, involving music sometimes, um, that have been the most successful. And then that's in addition to the usual education kind of family programs that we've implemented. So um, what is your favorite part of your job? <laughs> what do you, what do you like the best? Him? Yeah, no, no, of your job, of what you do. <laughs> What gives you, uh, what puts a smile on your face? <laughs> well, I love my job. Um, but what I prefer is to, um, to work with so many different personalities, so many directors, so many people. You know, for me, <clears throat> uh, my work is a strong collaboration with, a strong collaboration with many people different people and that's the richness I think of my my job because we have a re re really a respectful um, uh, relation we work together and I like to be part of a team I like to work with a team and I think that's what I prefer and you Melissa it's interesting Anne Sophie to hear you say that because it's true the role requires you to have a level of flexibility to be able to deal with different, very different people. I think what I like about the role, um, my job, I guess, uh, is that no day is the same. Yeah. There's not a single day where it's the same routine. There's not a single day where it's the same problems to solve. Because in some ways, I feel like my job is sometimes problem solver. Like you, <laughs> we often hear of things only when they need to be solved. <laughs> but um, I really enjoy that, that, you know, to be able to solve something, to be able, because where ultimately the idea is that you're, in a museum with art, and, and I do think contemporary art brings with, with it its own challenges. And that's really, you know, whether it's to be able to install an extraordinary, compelling work in spite of opposition, in spite of audiences, you know, maybe objecting to it, um, or now we have now we have a new uh, phenomenon, which is like guerrilla artists who like to place art in museums. It's new kinds of authorship. So, you know, we're living also in a moment, not, not to um, go on for too long, but we are living in this extraordinary moment where all of the things that we once did require a different kind of approach. And I've just, I, I've not kind of ever seen it like this before. I don't know if you would say this, Anne-Sophie, but it's true that, I mean, it's, it's just post-COVID, we feel like we're truly in the 21st century. Like everything that we once did as part of our museum work, we question. If we're doing our job, Right. If we're doing our job, we actually question all of the things that we took for granted. So that's what, I guess, it, a circuitous way of saying that's what I'm enjoying right now. Yeah. So this is my secret question I told you I was going to ask you but <laughs> didn't tell you. Secret question. No, no, no. no this is it. It's um, actually my son, who's also in the audience, dreamt this up. But it's what do you wish you could do that you cannot do? 
many things. <laughs> because I think I miss time, so there are so many things that I would love to do, but that I can't. Um, but I think that the most important thing that I would like to develop is the points that we developed uh, before, that's um, to increase and to enlarge the audience of our museum. That's the most important thing that I wish to do. And Melissa. So the Hirschhorn next year celebrates its 50th anniversary and we are embarking on a a whole revitalization of our campus. So we began the work of replacing, which is the kind of you know, unsexy part, but the, we replaced the facade of the museum. And now we're about to uh, begin work to revitalize our sculpture garden designed by Hiroshi Sugimoto. And when that is complete, we then redesign the entire um, interior of the museum with SOM and Seldorf, uh, Annabelle Seldorf. And so when we come to the end of that project, a three-phase project, it will be essentially a museum fully prepared for the 21st century. And so that's kind of the dream. It's like at the end of that, we will have a museum that where we can have flexible spaces to be able to show the large-scale work that artists are producing today and with all of the technology that, um, that is needed. So then you dream of what you wish you could do that you can do. That's <laughs> right, because clever. it's not a given. Very clever. Because it's not a given, right? Nothing is a given. <laughs> so I think, um, thank you very much. Um, I think we're ready for questions from the audience, if we if we have any, you were first, <laughs> then Alan. Thank you for your insightful uh, questions and answers. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned at the beginning uh, the strengths of working within a network of museums. Um, uh, I kind of wanted to touch upon the challenges of that also, because I know, and, so, and Sophie, in your case, you, it is from Hauteville, which is a house museum, to, all the way to the catacombs. And, you know, Melissa, like you're working within the Smithsonian context. So what are, um, what are the challenges of working in that, especially in this 21st century context, your roles and goals moving forward, part of this larger network? I think the challenge, generally speaking, because it's hard to talk about specifics, is um, persuading people who are not as interested in your cause as you are, like as a fundamental, right? So I think for us it's always how do we find the right partners who, for whom you know, they, they have the same interests and we can collaborate. So we're kind of always searching for the like-minded partner, um, whether it's in our field or, or not. And that goes to even within the Smithsonian, we look for the people who we can collaborate with, so. Um, for me, I would say that the, um, the first challenge is about the public, but we already talked about that because we really have to, to work to convince more and more audiences to come to our museum. But we also have to work to keep this museum uh, uh, affordable and, uh, and beautiful, and we have to work on renovation, we have to to work on fundraising, that's one big part of our job. But also, I think because we didn't have time to talk about that, but I think we have to be really involved in sustainability because I think that's one of our world at this moment. It's so important. Thank you. First, Alan, then you, Rick. Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm just curious whether any of the artists who have been on your TV series have ended up at the Hirshhorn. <laughs> well, one of the um, benefits museum. of winning was to have the work that they created 
put on display in the museum, which we did, actually. And does it have an accession number? We didn't acquire it, we showed it. Um, and it was by Basira Khan, and it was a fantastic work, actually, yeah. Thanks, Buffy. Um, uh, both of your institutions uh, are government institutions, and the staff are government employees. And you've talked about the audiences you want to attract and, and what they're interested in, and you've talked about the artists. Uh, what about your staff, uh, uh, your employees? Are you finding it difficult to convince them to do what you think should be done for your institution? Um, we have people, um, fonctionnaires, comme on dit, je ne sais pas. <laughs> Civil servants. But we also have people coming from private uh, areas, so um, it's quite different. We have different, uh, different métiers, en fait. Different trades, different professional backgrounds. Um, I think that people who love museum and culture are attracted by our uh, museums, you know? Um, but maybe the, um, it's, what? <laughs> so half of our staff are um, what we would say is privately funded and then half are federal workers. And yet, if you talk to individuals, you would never know, right? That's just where, how, how their, um, where their salary comes from. I think the interesting thing about the sense of community, I think, that we both have spoken about is that when a person goes to work at a museum, they, there's, most of them want to be with art. Some, uh, some of them are even artists. And so I think when we talk about why we're doing a particular project or initiative, We've often thought about the, we often talk about the mission, that we are actually all here to serve. I don't know if that's different from other museums, but it's very particular to DC, that we should be there to serve our public. If our public is coming into the door, we should be there to serve. And we, th we talk a lot at the Herschel about about the visitor experience. And I think that, that museums everywhere have been talking about that for decades. But I think for us that means something a little bit different, which is if a visitor's first encounter is with modern contemporary art, then how do you, what, what framework do you provide them to feel more comfortable with it, to understand it? And so we've done a lot of thinking about that um, and have, have created whether it's guides, video guides, other sorts of things that facilitate that relationship to the art. So um, I think your question is, you know, do, is the staff interested in that community building? I'd say majority are because mm. that's what's great about working at a museum, um, which is, um, yeah. Just pour compléter, je vais le dire en français, pardon. Um, je crois que ce qui est aussi passionnant dans les musées, c'est que nous avons différents types de métiers et vraiment, on a beaucoup de passionnés, mais surtout des métiers très différents, c'est-à-dire qu'on a des métiers de la surveillance, de la sécurité qui sont une grosse part de notre, de nos, de notre personnel, et puis on a toute l'équipe de, de curateurs, de commissaires, on a les services des publics, on a les services techniques. Enfin, un musée, c'est vraiment des personnels très différents et très complémentaires des uns des autres et qu'on qu qu ne pourrait pas résumer, en fait. Just to add something, I think that's what's fascinating about museums is that we have such different type of professional backgrounds and callings on our staff. We have people who are generally very passionate about what they're doing, but they have very different backgrounds. So for instance, we have the security staff. That's a very important part of our teams. We also have uh, the curatorial staff and of course the 
staff for welcoming the public, the technical teams, very, very different staff, and I think that's a particularity. Thank you both so much for a wonderful conversation. So, um, as Buffy sort of alluded, I work at a museum, I work at a museum across the street, um, and we feel the world pressing in on us, the tremendous pressures of the world right now, and they are, they have brought about protest, they've brought about requests for things to change. Um, it, and I believe that this affects all museums, whatever kind of art they hold, certainly modern and contemporary history museums, etc. How are you telling the history? Who is telling the history? And who will come and um, dispute with you about who has the right to do that? And I'd like to hear how um, how you're approaching this time, which I think is very unique in our lives. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I can. I can if you, you want. I, I don't mind. Oh, okay. Great question. Because there's not a day that goes by where something... Um, that something happens that's unusual, that's a request or a demand that comes to us. There is no preparation for it. I mean, I sometimes feel like um, we are in a perpetual crisis management. We've become very expert at it. Um, I think that the starting point for us would be a determination as to whether the other person is a potential partner. Be partner meaning, can you sit down and have a conversation with that person? Because confrontational, confrontation and combat doesn't quite work in this moment. That's what I found. I, we, we, we are living in very aggress and a very aggressive, demonstrable moment. And it's not always possible to have those conversations, but if they can be had, it would be a starting point. But you're right, institutions are are in a very difficult place right now. So. Pour ma part, je pense que les, les musées sont vraiment euh, des acteurs en fait, de la vie culturelle. Et à ce titre-là, on attend beaucoup d'eux, c'est-à-dire qu'on attend euh, qu'ils qu s'interrogent sur les grands enjeux de la société. Et je pense que ça fait partie de notre rôle. Et donc on peut s'interroger à la fois euh, à travers la programmation artistique euh, d'exposition, mais ça va être aussi à partir des de programmations culturelles, ça va être avec les, les débats que nous organisons. Mais oui, nous faisons partie en fait, de l'actualité et, et je pense que nous devons euh, réagir au sujet de société. As for myself, I think that museums are really actors of cultural life. So a great deal is expected of them. And so we are expected to ask ourselves these major social questions. That's part of museums' role. And it's going to come up in the programming choices we make, what exhibitions, but also what cultural activities do we hold, what debates and conversations will we have. We have a responsibility to be part of current events and to react to them. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. So I have one question for you, uh, Anne-Sophie. Uh, je vais la poser en français si ça ne dérange pas. Uh, je voulais savoir, ce n'est pas trop compliqué uh, d'être directrice quand on n'a pas forcément un parcours universitaire artistique, sachant que dans ce monde-là, tout le monde vient, par exemple, des beaux-arts en France ou 
Comment on se fait entendre, par exemple So the question is whether it's, isn't it, or what are the challenges, or is it very difficult to be a museum director or a, a director of an institution like Anne-Sophie is when one doesn't have a university background in the arts the way the vast majority of people in museums in France today do, coming from fine arts schools and so on? Alors c'est vraiment un choix qui a été fait par la ville de Paris, euh, effectivement que le directeur de général en fait de Paris Musée, enfin la directrice générale soit et un profil administratif, parce que justement euh, le contenu artistique, les propositions artistiques émanent des directeurs et des directrices de musée. Donc euh, moi je vois mon rôle comme un rôle de facilitateur et en fait on, on se on se complète très bien, c'est-à-dire que euh, moi je suis celle qui va euh, défendre le budget qui qui va aller chercher les fonds, qui va en fait rendre euh, la programmation artistique possible. Donc en fait, il n'y a pas de compétition entre nous, il y a au contraire une vraie complémentarité, et je crois que c'est ce qui fait la force de notre, de notre fonctionnement, et euh, ça se passe dans des conditions très, euh, très respectueuses et, euh, et, et assez simples en fait. This was truly a choice on the part of the city of Paris for the director general of Paris Musée to have an administrative background. Because in fact, all the different directors of the museums within Paris Musée, they are in charge of the art content and they have that background. My role as director general is truly as a facilitator. So we complete each other. It's my job to defend or champion the budget to do fundraising and they make I make the artistic propositions that they have possible so there's no rivalry between us we actually complement each other very well and our relationship I think a strength of our relationship is how well we work together in a um, respectful and actually simple way Shall I go? Oh. You go ahead, and then you. Uh, who's who? <laughs> Me? Yeah. All right. Uh, because it's such a crucial question these days, uh, <clears throat> you were talking about how the institution has to react, uh, has to have some kind of position. Uh, wh who are you in solidarity with in culture wars, for example? I do you take the position of, the, of a government directive of how to respond? Do you uh, uh, find, determine who the good guys are from your perspective? Or do you fight to maintain a certain neutrality, political neutrality for the institution and let the actual people who you're programming uh, be part of that discourse rather than yourselves? Because this is really the issue that we're dealing with today. Alors, euh, nous ne suivons pas de, de directive gouvernementale ou municipale pour notre programmation. Euh, et euh, les directrices et les directeurs de musées, quand ils, quand ils programment des expositions, euh, ne cherchent pas, je pense, à être neutres. Je pense que ça n'est pas, ça pas euh, le, leur souhait et leur, et leur façon de travailler. Après, je pense que les débats et la programmation culturelle est aussi là pour compléter, pour apporter des points de vue complémentaires de la proposition artistique et celle de, des expositions. Je vais juste traduire cela, s'il vous plaît. Um, we don't follow government directives in our programming. The museum directors, in their choice of exhibitions, I don't think that they're trying to be neutral. That's neither their wish, in my opinion, or the way that they work. But we do have debates and activities that can complement the, 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 the programming, the exhibitions. I wasn't sure if you were directing it to me. 
So we, the Hushorn is, receives federal funding, but is at arm's length, and so our programs are determined by our curators and staff. And, you know, I mean, there's no museum in this country that hasn't thought about this cultural moment, and I think it's been over the last three years. I think our own, um, our own thinking on this is that the museum's mission is, is to um, provide a platform for artists, and then the, the art that we show speaks for itself. I uh, just want to echo the thanks for this great dialogue. I'm curious, the, the questions have touched on this and your responses have touched on this as well, but sort of more pointedly, the future of museums. What is it that you hope for them, or is it sort of too silly even to think about it, given the responses we have to do sort of in the moment, or sort of ask another way, what do you hope for emerging leaders in museums? What do you hope for them to be prepared to lead future museums? I think what we're all grappling with at this moment in time is the changing expectations for museums. That we are in a field that is determined by so much legacy, the legacy of our collection, the legacy of our building. And the one thing that we know that we can change is the way that we talk about the art in our museum. And so I think the hope for the future would be that we already know that, pe that visitors value museums. They value our collections. They value our role within society. I think the hope for the future would be that museums perhaps do a better job at representing society and representing the different voices within it. Oui, je suis d'accord. Je pense qu'effectivement, il y a un socle qui restera, qui est la présentation, la préservation des collections, euh, euh, l'élargissement des publics, l'organisation d'expositions. Mais je pense qu'effectivement, les, les, dir les dirigeants, enfin, les directrices, les directeurs de musées euh, doivent perpétuellement se renouveler, perpétuellement être à l'écoute en fait, des attentes de nos publics. Et on voit bien qu que la façon de travailler n'est pas la même qu'il y a dix ans et elle sera différente certainement dans, dans dix ans. Donc on doit toujours être à l'écoute, à la fois pour, être, euh, voilà, pour faire partie des... De, pour répondre aux enjeux de société et puis pour réfléchir à la meilleure façon permanente de, de nous améliorer parce que c'est vraiment comme ça qu'on travaille et là on a vu depuis avec la crise sanitaire à quel point euh, la façon de présenter, de, de, de faire de la médiation dans nos expositions euh, qui est devenue tout d'un coup euh, totalement numérique, on est en train de revenir là-dessus parce que moi je pense que il n'y a rien qui est plus important que de ce contact du public avec les œuvres donc voilà, on, on traverse des moments et on, on doit s'adapter aussi aux attentes et, euh, et je pense qu'il y a aussi... Euh, voilà, on, on parlait du développement durable. Je pense que les musées ils doivent être acteurs du développement durable. Il faut qu'ils se posent la question de l'intelligence artificielle. Enfin, on est toujours, toujours, toujours dans, un, dans des questions perpétuelles et c'est aussi notre rôle. I agree with Melissa. I think that there's a foundation that will always remain, which is the presentation and exhibition of our collections, enlarging the public, and so on. But the directors of museums have to constantly be renewing themselves, listening to public expectations. Um, and you can see that in the fact that the way that we work today is different than how it was 10 years ago, and it probably will be different again 10 years from now. We have to always be 
listening, to be on the lookout, to think about what the important social questions and stakes of the moment are, and to improve that way. We saw this um, with the COVID crisis. The way that we made our exhibitions available, which became completely digital, is something that we really have to think about now, that we are thinking about now, because it allowed such a different access for audience. So we constantly have to face and think about the moment. Museums have to drive sustainability, in my opinion. We need to ask ourselves about artificial intelligence. These constantly, this constant questioning, I believe, is part of our role. Is there one more last question? Yeah. yeah. La curiosité, peut-être. <rire> la curiosité, euh, l'ouverture d'esprit et, euh, et l'amour, euh, peut-être, de, de l'art et des artistes. Curiosity, open-mindedness, love of art and artists. I was going to say crisis management. <rire> Utopique. <rire> Well, thank you very much for very vivid questions to our panel. I think there's champagne exactly. from Touchard. <laughs>